Hi, well, welcome to our campus conversations. I'm Michael Schaefer. I'm the editor of Washingtonian. I'm going to be talking today with Sylvia Matthews Burwell. She's the president of American University. If you have questions and would like to join our conversation, put them in the Q&A box. The, uh, the chat window, uh, you can say nice things about us. You can say terrible things about us. Please don't. But uh, I'm actually not going to be looking at that during the uh, talk. I will be looking at the Q&A window, and I'm going to try to get as many of those questions answered uh, as possible. Uh, so let me start. Uh, Sylvia Matthews Burwell, our guest today. Uh, she was announced as the next president of American University in January of 2017. If you're keeping track at home, that was the same month as Donald Trump became the president of the United States. Uh, these two events are not unrelated. Uh, until that month, uh, President Burwell was the United States Secretary of Health and Human Services under President Barack Obama. She oversaw an agency that includes the National, Institute, National Institutes of Health, the Centers for Disease Control, FDA, Medicaid, Medicare, and a bunch of other things that have been in the news lately. Prior to being in the cabinet, she was the director of the Office of Management and Budget. That oversees this little thing called the Federal Budget of the United States. Uh, in a way, when she was a Appointed, this was a little bit of a strange choice. Uh, President Burwell does not come out of academia. Gasp, she does not have a PhD. Uh, but she does have a long track record of leadership in Washington. And particularly in the last six months, uh, in case you hadn't noticed, her professional CV and the challenges of running a university have come together in ways that we could never have imagined or wanted. Uh, President Burwell is the woman who ran HHS during the Ebola and Zika crises, and she's now making decisions about how to keep a campus safe during a new pandemic. And she's a person who oversaw the trillion dollar HHS budget, and she's now facing a crisis that is putting a lot of financial strain on universities. This was already a challenge before, and it's an even bigger one now, which means we got a lot to talk about today. And thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me today, Mike. So let me start with where we're at now. You have a job that's put you at the center of so many things going on in our American life right now. There's this public health crisis, of course, um, but at universities, among other places, there's also an economic challenge. And there's a tech challenge of how do you teach and form a community with people at distance. And there's a cultural challenge, which is part of going away to college is not just learning things, it is this sort of socio-cultural uh, experience. And how do you recreate that at distance or how do you make up for that when everybody, we should hope, comes back? So t talk to me a little bit about the basics. Where is AU right now in terms of who's on campus, who's not on campus and how you're doing? So at American University, our first day of classes actually was yesterday. Um, and in the early part of the summer in June, we had a plan of plan that we put together all the details for to do hybrid or blended learning where some classes would be face-to-face, -face, others would be online, and any student could choose what they wanted to do uh, if a class was face-to-face. -face. We also were going to bring back about 50% of our residents on campus. But as the summer evolved and in the July time frame where we saw those case counts going higher and higher and higher, um, and then we also saw the strain on testing that was occurring both in terms of the availability of tests, but the timetable on which you could get test results. And then uh, what was added is in this region, the DC region, Maryland and Northern Virginia, all the schools went online in terms of uh, elementary and secondary schools. And then the mayor of the District of Columbia uh, said that anyone coming from hotspot states would need to uh, be in quarantine for 14 days. All of those things came together and we made a decision at the end of July to go online and to not have our students come in residence. And our decisions all throughout this period of time have been based on three principles. The first principle is the health and safety of our AU community. The second principle is how do we maximize for achieving against our core mission of learning, scholarship, and community. And then the third decision-making principle that we used is how are we participating as members of our broader community? American University, other than the government's the fifth largest employer uh, in the District of Columbia. And we also uh, would contribute not just in economic ways, but health ways, depending on what we did. Those were the three principles and that's where we are and where we started uh, uh, yesterday in terms of online classes. What kind, of investments has, what kind of investments has AU had to make 
in the technology to be able to get this done? You know, one of the things we were fortunate with at American University is that at American University, we already taught 500 classes online. At AU, our online MBA is in the top 20 in the country. And so we had some experience with this. As a matter of fact, as part of our strategy, the day that we announced that we would be going online in March, our chief online officer started because we were expanding and thinking about those efforts. So we did have some experience though, in a 10 day period, our faculty moved 2000 classes uh, to online, which was quite a feat. Wow. So this is obviously pretty different from the way you and I uh, went to college. Talk to me about how confident you are in being able to provide a quality education uh, at this distance. So one of the reasons that so many people choose American University is the quality of our faculty and the engagement of that faculty. Mm -hmm. And that's something that while we're in a different mode has not changed. Um, and our faculty continue to have, you know, students are going to have that experience with our faculty. Um, in the spring, uh, we teach a course that is about chemistry and cooking. It's, a che it's called chemistry and cooking. And the professor there actually sent the ingredients to the students you know, in packages so that they could do experiments about heat and temperature and how things interact. And so our high quality faculty, that's something that our students are going to continue to have. They're having it in a different mode. The engagement of our faculty at American University, we pride ourselves on that engagement of faculty, whether that's helping students in the classroom or outside the classroom as they think about their careers, as they think about internships. We actually at American University have already had um, a virtual career fair at the end of the year and we're going to continue to do many of those things to engage our students already uh, I think over a hundred of our clubs and organizations are figuring out ways that they're going to move forward even as we're in an online mode for the fall are you worried it'll be too good like if people say next year you know what that was fine I don't think I want to come back and pay for the dorms so I think that what um, this crisis will do as part of higher education, and on that specific question, I think people are gonna feel that there is real value um, for people in terms of residential experience, that four-year residential experience. I think people will value it and will want to come back. But I think it's not an or statement, it's an and statement. And I think that what we're going to find is an acceleration of different tools that you can use. And whether that's for a four-year residential experience, should we have some digital components? Should that large lecture that you did for economics, the first economics class you uh, did, should we maybe do that in different ways? Should we think about things like that? From that, which is part of a residential experience, all the way to how we think about different types of experiences in post-secondary, out of high school, education. And this has been a part of our strategy. Um, we redid our strategy two years ago. And the idea of what we refer to as lifelong learning and the idea that really higher education is a little like people think about Amazon and Amazon Prime, where you want it, when you want it, how you want it. And I think universities are going to, in a post-COVID world, think even more about that. And so that's an accelerated change. But I think the value of a face-to-face -face undergraduate education is going to be something that will continue. How we think about doing that will be something that hopefully we will learn from this period. So one of the people in the audience asked a question about how will students be able to participate in clubs. But I'd like to take that out a little bit further because, you know, as you've said, uh, college is about more than just taking poli sci 101 or whatever. It's about uh, joining a culture, uh, joining a culture that is passed down from juniors and seniors to sophomores and freshmen. Uh, this is an interruption in that. Uh, the people who are starting school, the first year students doing this remotely are not actually gonna get to know uh, upperclassmen. Uh, and how are you gonna make sure that that culture stitches itself together? So you have to work hard and you have to really think about it. And for example, our orientation is done by orientation leaders who are upperclassmen. And our orientation actually was done in small groups in terms of it wasn't just you know, large sessions where you're listening to a person. And so our orientation leaders are getting to know their groups of students. Our advisors are reaching out directly student by student. In terms of these issues of culture, um, last Friday at American University, we actually believe in uh, a commencement 
but also we at the beginning um, have an inaugural uh, ceremony that we do at American University every year. And so we did that ceremony uh, last Friday and you had to do it online, but we preserved a number of the traditions and at least making sure people knew. I appeared in my gowns and regalia, as did the provost. We were in different places. Our vice president of campus life, who always participates in that. We have our scholar teacher of the year speak, because when you as a student start at American University, we want you to know what we are about and what we honor. We honor our um, faculty that both value what's happening in the classroom as well as that scholarship and research. When I gave my remarks, I talked about something that when the students come, I want them to do. When we do the ceremony, every student walks by the eagle and touches the talon for good luck. So I encourage that when every student does get to campus, they do that. And so we are looking for the ways to try and preserve and make sure that we are building community and that we are creating relationships. Is it harder to do virtually? Yes, but it means we need to put the effort in to do it. I imagine it's more than just a sentimental question because the people who feel bonded to the community today wind up becoming the generous alumni of tomorrow. It is, it is true and you know, our alumni have been great. When we were in the March timeframe and there were many students who we needed to provide some help and assistance and support so that they could go home, our alumni have put together a fund um, to help pay for students and our alumni have contributed to helping us make sure that there are some students who where technology may be a challenge and whether that's the hardware, the bandwidth, any of those things. And so our alumni have come together in great ways to help and support us as we work through those challenges. So because I'm the editor of Washingtonian, I'm always curious about people's path to Washington and uh, we wanted to ask you a little bit about yours. You grew up in West Virginia. What was that like? So I am from a very small town in West Virginia. Right now there are about 2,600 people. It's a little town called Hinton, West Virginia. Um, and my path to Washington, DC, uh, I've, I've been here a number of times. Uh, and my first trip to Washington, DC was when I was in the sixth grade and we raised money. Um, my sixth grade class, we raised money and we came to Washington, D.C. And I still have all the pictures from that first trip to Washington, D.C. And in, a, I guess, a little bit of foreshadowing, we were very fortunate and both of West Virginia senators at that time, Jennings Randolph and Robert Byrd, um, welcomed my sixth grade class. And we still have the photo of all of us on the Capitol. And so from West Virginia and growing up in this small town, uh, where my parents were quite active in uh, public service and civic engagement. I like to say my dad was a member of every funny hat organization that there is, the Lions Club, the Shriners, mm -hmm. um, the Moose. Uh, my mother was president of the church uh, of the church women for 26 years. And so that was kind of what I grew up with. I went off to college uh, and I went to Harvard undergraduate, and then I was fortunate enough to uh, win a Rhodes Scholarship and study at Oxford. Came back, worked in New York, and in the middle of that time, I was working for a management consulting firm, McKinsey. I uh, received a call and was able to go work on the Clinton campaign down in Little Rock, and then served eight years in the Clinton administration, and went on. So during that time, I lived in Washington again, and then went to Seattle with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, went to the Walmart Foundation, and then came back to D.C. Um, again. So that's, so I've been here twice. I read about your, uh, you know, early, like, as a kid, involvement in politics. And yeah. you come from a place that uh, nowadays people think of as deep Trump country. Mm -hmm. uh, but you actually worked for, volunteered for these politicians who appear to be Democrats and appear to have actually won. Uh, what did what'd you learn about politics? So I um, was fortunate to participate. Uh, the first campaign I, I worked on, I will say, was a losing campaign. And it was um, Jay Rockefeller's first run for uh, governor. Uh, but the second time that he ran for governor was when I was in uh, the sixth grade and mentioned that. And my friends and I had started a newspaper called the Central News and World Report. Central was our elementary school. So we created a newspaper and we were granted the first interview that Jay Rockefeller gave when he came to visit our town and our county mm -hmm. as he was kicking off that campaign. And I will say that I think the coverage in the Central News and World Report put him on a much better path. He won that second uh, uh, time. So I learned about reporting. I learned about this from the side that you sit on 
uh, in terms of media and journalism, uh, in terms of some of my first engagement and the first campaign locally that I worked on was my best friend Christie's father who was running for county commissioner. And uh, we did a lot of handing out of leaflets uh, to help and support his candidacy. So you showed up in Washington in 1992, 93, very different city at the time. What was it like for you? Where'd you live? How'd you experience the city? Well, my first time in the city was actually a summer. And that was the summer of my, uh, between my, I guess that one was between my sophomore and junior year. And I was a Lyndon Baines Johnson intern on the Hill. And so that is in the 1980s, um, dating myself. Um, and that was my first time in Washington, D.C. I worked for Congressman Nick Joe Rahal, uh, and I did uh, everything from correspondence to write a piece on uh, the consolidation and regulation of banking uh, industry when I was here. So I was here the first time then, and then the second time then. And as a city, um, the city has continued to advance and grow, I think, in terms of being a great place uh, to live and to be. So you had, you then left, you took these big jobs at the Gates Foundation and the Walmart Foundation. Gates Foundation's endowment, as I looked this up, it may have changed with the stock market, uh, was like $46 billion. And and then you worked uh, with even bigger dollar figures in the federal government. And now you are the president of a mid-sized university where the endowment is in the 700 millions of dollars. Uh, what's, the, what's that like? How's, how is that different for you? Tell me about that experience. So um, budgets and working with budgets, which I've had the chance to do at a number of different organizations, I think you know, the budgeting, budgeting issues and budgeting process, there are certain key themes in terms of how you think about choices, how you think about application of resources that um, continue, whether it's the federal budget or the budget of American universities. So many important lessons as one works through um, that. I think one of the things that's different when one is working on the federal budget at the Office of Management Budget versus American University, and it's one of the things that I like, is that you're much closer. So on a daily basis, I get to see you know, the things that one is budgeting about. Uh, you know, in terms of we make a very large commitment to financial aid at American University, I get to see the students. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the things that I think is a great thing about being at a university is that you see the students, the faculty, and the staff on a daily basis. And so you get to really feel and see the impact of what the budgeting is doing. Because I think for me, budgeting is always about a reflection of values and what you want to achieve. And so there are certain rules and approaches, but at its fundamental, that's what it's about. It's a, it's a means. To an end and that end has to be either about representation of values or what you want to achieve and so you get closer to that when you're at a university. So one of the things you did want to achieve when you took over was sort of raising AU's profile. What, what were some of the priorities in order to do that? Well so I think the first thing uh, that I did was work on a new strategy uh, for the university to build on the work that had been done by um, my predecessor and as part of that effort I asked three questions of everyone to get to the answer of, I don't believe, I believe that reputation and those things are based on substance. So that's why I'm starting with strategy uh, to answer this question, because I believe you put together your strategy and then you come to the questions of, of, of the other part. So I asked three questions of faculty, alumni, staff, um, our students. And the three questions were one, what is the one thing that you believe differentiates American University? Two, what's the one thing you think we need to change to go to our next level? And three, what's the one thing you need to stay, uh, you believe needs to stay the same mm -hmm. for American University to go to its next level? And that all came together and our strategy um, right now is called Change Makers for a Changing World. Because what you found in those conversations and the depth of those conversations um, is that whether you're on the faculty, the staff, or the students at American University, there is a passion. And whether that is a passion uh, if you're in music, or a passion if you're in the sciences, or at the business school, or a school of public affairs, that people tend to have a passion about changing the world, coming, getting tools, and then changing the world. And whether that is the, you know, 
Alice Paul and others who were very involved in a, a movement we just celebrated, you know, the fact that our law school was founded by women in the late 1800s, we're the first university to be carbon neutral, or someone in the arts, one of our students is their final project in their music, did a composition that reflected the fact that our campus is an arboretum. Hmm. So this was a theme. Uh, and as we talk about the institution and moving it forward, it is helping people know that's what we're about. I imagine being a college president and, and trying to make change is a little bit tricky because you got all these people who work for you and you can't fire them because they got tenure. I guess that's not that different from the federal government. In the federal government, you can <laughs> um, in terms of those issues. But part of it is, is you know, I, when I talked about our strategy, I mentioned that, it, you know, what is our core mission? Our core mission is learning, scholarship and research is the creation of that knowledge and the moving of that knowledge. But community is also a core part of that. And that's one of the things in terms of moving the institution. When I talked about that process, the change makers for a changing world, it had to do with what the community felt, what the community saw. Certainly I came and came from the outside and um, had thoughts about the changing world of higher education. But a lot of this comes from the community. And when it comes from the community, I think that's when uh, you can move forward because you're building on something that the team uh, is a part of. So I understand you guys are phasing out this wonk branding, which really centered the school around public policy and sort of officially Washington things. What, what's, uh, what's being pushed in, in its place? So um, right now we're in the middle of that process. I think the articulation of our strategy in its current form, Change Makers for a Changing World, how that will transfer to um, taglines and that sort of thing is a process that we're in the middle of. The WAMP campaign I think was an important one for both making sure that the university was recognized in terms of the rankings of our School of Public Affairs, the uh, rankings of our School of International Service top 10 uh, in the country for both graduate and undergraduate. It was about making sure people knew about the academic uh, rigor. I mean, people joke at American uh, University that, you know, when one thinks about, you know, watching debates, and, you know, those are major events uh, for our university in terms of big things that, that people do. At AU right now, uh, we're number two in the nation for the model UN. Uh, in terms of things like that. And so it was a representation so people could come to understand that part of American University. I think we've made progress on that. And now we're gonna build on that and move to the next stage, which is about this idea that American University is a place where you can come, get the tools uh, to be and create and cause the change that you wanna have in the world. One of the things we talk about at our magazine is the sort of capital W Washington and lowercase W Washington, the, the hometown and the company town. And one of the things you've done is try to reach out to the hometown. Um, there's uh, some scholarships for DC students, which I'm of course interested in as a DCPS parent and college is expensive. Um, but uh, what's the, what was the thinking behind that? So as you're mentioning, the idea of engaging with Washington and the region is actually an element of our strategy. And we did that because we as a community feel that that really is an important part of being an excellent institution in terms of being an excellent university. And so we prioritize that engagement in three basic areas. One is in education, economics, and the arts are the three different areas. And for example, American University, when the Corcoran Museum closed, um, part of the art went to the National Gallery, but we were fortunate to receive the vast majority of the art from the Corcoran, and that was $30 million worth of art to go to our Cats and Art Museum, which now is the seminal place in D.C. for artists of the region, for D.C. artists. And as part of making sure that we are showing that art, we got the art out within a year of receipt, and the first exhibit that we did was all curated by our graduate students. So bringing together what we do as a university with ideas and concepts of the district. Um, in the education space, you mentioned this past year, we announced that we would be providing $3 million in scholarships that would be targeted to students in the district. And we're engaged in making sure that we're trying to attract students from Washington, D.C to American University. We're also focused on another project, which it, it involves education, which is the DC teacher pipeline. And the idea that having students come to American University and then return to 
the district schools. And we have our first scholarship this year, our first scholarship student whose uh, academic time at American University will be paid for through a scholarship and they will be returning into the DC public school system, which we're excited about being a part of strengthening the schools in our local region. This city is obviously quite polarized, uh, has a very large gap between rich and poor, affluent and not. Um, and we are, as you know, in the midst of this really wrenching national moment about race, justice, fairness. AU was home to maybe the leading, the most important public intellectual of this moment, Ibram X. Kendai, and he left. What happened? So, you know, we're thrilled that um, Ibram Kendi was here and started the original anti-racist policy and research center here at American University. And he came here, uh, you know, this was before any of the conversations that we're currently having occurred. And this is a priority issue. As with many scholars, they moved to different places. We wish Dr. Kendi and Ibram very well and are excited about the work that he continues to do, but excited about how we built on the work and the center that was started. We're very fortunate at American University. Uh, many people know, you know, some of our scholars like Angela Davis, who has written Policing the Black Man, you know, our criminal justice and race areas are places where we have quite a bit of scholarship. But across these issues, we at American University, which is why we were a place to start an anti-racist um, policy and research center out of the gate and be the first one in the country. So we wish him well. We're excited about the work he's doing and we're excited about the work we're gonna to continue to do. When you look back, is there anything you could have done to keep him? You know, in terms of people making their decisions about where they go and that sort of thing, those are um, personal decisions that people make uh, in terms of any number of things. But we're in a position where we're excited to continue moving forward. Uh, we have interim leadership that we're excited about. We have a process bringing together our faculty and administrators to think about exactly what can we achieve in that space uh, in terms of our anti-racist policy and research center and how that our academic work infuses the work on issues of race in our campus and beyond. So the center continues then? The center absolutely is uh, continuing and it is a search that we will be doing even in the midst of a hiring freeze uh, for the university. You know, there are places where we are going to continue and this is certainly one of them. So when, um, when we spoke yesterday, I was, uh, you, you mentioned these stats about the number of uh, college students in Washington, or of students in Washington, which I think people don't really associate this with being a college town, but it is a pretty enormous college town. It is. Um, there are some statistics that show on a per capita basis, Washington, D.C. has more students per capita than Boston, which is generally known as a, a more of a college town, but we do, and there are many universities. My colleagues at, you know, whether it's uh, Georgetown, GW, Trinity, um, uh, Howard, Catholic, uh, and then those that are even outside in uh, Northern Virginia or in Maryland that are part of a, a whole community of universities. We work together in something called the consortium, which brings together all the universities so that we can think and work together. And this is part of making sure we build that relationship with DC and the region, uh, but also that we work together. Well, one of the, I mean, I, I grew up near AU. And one of the things about college towns is there's sort of cool used bookstores and little boutiques and stuff. There's not much of that around America nor around most of the other DC universities. Why is that? I mean, why is there the, the, the kind of college quarter not happening? So I think um, a couple of things. One is we're in a very residential area. It's one of the uh, advantages and why we can be an arboretum uh, we have what you would consider a traditional quad, which you can see behind me uh, in terms of my, uh, my back shot. And so we are in a residential area and that does make a difference in what we do. I think the other thing is we all sort of reflect on what um, those elements of a college experience were and were important in creating that college experience. I think many of our students say how they think about um, what 
they do in terms of when we think about them and their reading of their books and bookstores and, and how they do much of their uh, reading and work online in terms of things. And so many of the things that are about those experiences, whether that's how students come together in the organizations to do the things they do, whether that's, as I said, the Model UN, the sports and athletics were Division I um, sports school in, in terms of what they do, uh, all of those kinds of things. At American University, we have something called the Humanities Truck, mm -hmm. which is actually, you know, our students and our faculty take this truck out and it's about gathering stories or using things that we have historically to have exhibits that can move to the community in DC. Our students do quite a bit of engagement in DC. In a normal year, uh, at this point in time in the week, in our first week, we would be having students all over the district. We have a day that is part of our students' orientation where they volunteer for organizations across the district uh, and the region so that they can become engaged with the community. So I think there are a number of elements, but I hear you in terms of what I think of as a, a, an experience, but I will say that is evolving uh, in terms of what our students think. One of the folks in the audience asked this question, I, let me share it with you. For students who are considering applying to American University this fall and winter, what would you say makes American an ideal DC institution? Um, I think what makes American an ideal uh, DC institution is the combination of our quality faculty and staff, the engagement that we have with uh, students, as well as the importance that we place on experiential learning. And so it's strong curricular as in what happens in the classroom and that engagement with people, as well as what happens outside of the classroom. In terms of the percentage of our students who do uh, internships, which is an important part of Washington, D.C., or our participation in the Greater Washington Partnership Effort, that's a group of companies that have come together and we worked, universities worked with them to say what is it they need. Uh, in terms of that. And so there's a credential that you can get at American University that then will lead to a situation where you will be considered uh, in terms of internships and jobs. And so those are the kinds of things, as well as our beautiful campus at a university that was the first university to be carbon neutral in the country. I think bringing that together is what makes us a unique DC university that whoever that is, I'd recommend you apply. I'd like to change gears for just a second and ask you about your last job, where you presumably did not have to answer questions from the likes of me about why there was no used bookstore in the neighborhood. <laughs> You'd be surprised at what questions you get. Well, you know, your old agency, HHS, is right in the middle of this huge global crisis. Do you ever think, like, man, I wish I was back in the action? Um, no, no, and I'm very fortunate because I love what I do now, and so that I think keeps you away. Do I think about how to solve the problem that is before us that is related to the work I used to do? Yes. Um, you know, it, I face it as an individual with my family, I face it as a leader of an institution, so I think about it in those forms, but I um, love where I am, happy where I am, but so don't think about it in that form. Uh, you were there when Ebola hit, which I think had 11 cases in the United States. How would you assess this administration's performance? So I tend to not, um, what I will say is I, I will respond to that not in the form of assessing the current administration's response, but instead maybe articulate how I've been thinking about the problem, which is what would I do? Mm -hmm. uh, if I were in my old job, what would I do? Um, to help us get to a different place with different outcomes. You know, the number of dead in the country, I, I just think we, I think, you know, thinking about how many people have died um, of this disease already uh, in less than a year is, is an extreme thing that I believe we need to think about. Those who have been sick and will be permanently impaired, um, the economic impact and the mental health impact, all of that together. So what would I do? I think is the way I kind of think about that question. First and foremost, I think giving people a frame to think about this issue is quite important. Prevention, detection, and response. That is how one handles a public health crisis. Prevention, detection, response. As you, as even as you're thinking about whether to go to a grocery store at two in the, you know, at six in the morning or six at night, anything, just keeping that in mind, even in your individual life, giving the country a frame for how we think about it is important. The second thing, if I were in my old job, I would focus on the federal government has two responsibilities. Those responsibilities are providing Americans with the tools, and whether that's the hospitals, 
the state officials, public health officials, or individual citizens with the tools that they need to combat this. And the second responsibility is communicating. And communication in a, a global pandemic is extremely important because what we have to remember is that in order to fight this, we as individual citizens have an important role. And so communications becomes important because everyone has a role. And second, it is extremely important because there is evolution and change. We, as we know, we've gained much knowledge about COVID-19 over the period. So it's changing. So clarity of communication and consistency of communication in a changing dynamic where you as an individual have to play a role becomes even more important. In this administration, the president famously uh, spends a lot of time on Twitter and uh, says things that are sometimes intemperate and angry and uh, certainly at, at odds with previous statements. Um, has he kind of poisoned the well in terms of the government being a credible communicator about this? Well, I think one of the things that's important is that we listen to um, scientists, and I know that there are questions, you know, experts and, and how experts are viewed and that sort of thing, but I think returning to a place where we listen to our scientists as they are often the speakers and we take our cues from them, which would lead us to the last part of, as I think about the thing, we need a national approach to testing, uh, contact tracing, and we also, you know, we need a national approach to testing because that is a critical path issue to solving this. Uh, testing has been treated at various times like a diagnostic tool, a tool for diagnosing people. But in a disease like COVID-19, where it is passed asymptomatically, so you don't know, if you have it, you could be passing it. It needs to be a surveillance tool. And so thinking about that piece of it, and then what follows is once you get the testing in place, you have to do the correct contact tracing and isolation. The other thing is we as citizens all need to do what we need to do, which is masks, distance, hand washing, uh, in terms of the, the pieces that we need to do. And I would also be remiss as a former HHS secretary if I didn't say right here and now, flu shots, uh, very important. So that's how I think about some of the pieces and parts. You know, I'm glad we're moving quickly to a vaccine. That's very important. Um, that needs to keep going, but we need these other steps too. How could we be in a situation where it takes two weeks to get test results back? Is that something that had to happen? Is this a function of technology or was there a policy fail somewhere? So, you know, I think that that's why I'm so focused on testing and I have been uh, in all the comments that I've made since the beginning of this is that focus on the testing. The testing becomes important diagnostically from a surveillance perspective and it's also the testing that gives us the ability to know many things about the disease. I think you probably saw this week that we know that an individual has gotten it again. Uh, you know, it now has COVID-19 a second time. Testing is how we found that out. Testing tells you so many different things. Testing helps us understand how this spreads. And so testing from day one needs to be a huge priority in terms of getting tests that are reliable, fast, uh, and accessible and easy to use. What would it take to get those for our country? You know, I think that we've seen other countries have national testing strategies and be able to scale. And I think we need to look at the examples of how they've done that uh, and make sure we do. When you think about the investment, when you think about the losses in the economy and the amount of money, time and effort it would take to bring testing to scale um, and the money that we are losing in the economy because of the constraints that we have to have on it because of COVID-19, I think that the economics and numbers on that probably look pretty good. The president has criticized uh, the, the Obama administration's response to Zika and Ebola. Uh, what do you, how do you respond to that? So um, I would first say, as with anything, one can always do things better and you learn each time you do. And, and that was something we focused on uh, quite a bit, but really from the beginning in Ebola, uh, the number of cases that we had in the US we limited those numbers of cases, we were prepared, we were able to treat those cases um, well, and containing the spread in West Africa was extremely important and we had to play a role in doing that. So I think one of the things that you would see if you read the report that we did, I actually asked um, 
external folks to come in and do an assessment of our Ebola response. Uh, and one of the things was that importance of communication. And that was something that we did and we thought we were doing, but you could always do more and better. I think, uh, you know, in terms of assessing the response to our Ebola and Zika crises, I think most people have forgotten both of those uh, in terms of the detrimental impact to both people's health and the economy. And they both were very serious uh, things. At one point during the Ebola crisis, 17% of college students believed that they or someone they knew would get Ebola. And when you think about the mortality rate of Ebola, uh, you know, it had reached that kind of a fevered pitch. But I think where we are now in terms of uh, how people think about it is a reflection of the assessment of the work that we did. I'm thinking about the FDA, which you also oversaw, mm -hmm. HHS secretary. Did you ever face a situation like we had last week uh, where the, the FDA is moving more slowly than some people would like and there was political pressure, in this case from the president, to, uh, to hustle up? So this issue and question of making sure the independence of our health agencies um, and that they have the ability to do the science in the ways um, that you need to do uh, is a very important thing. And this gets to the earlier point you were talking about in terms of confidence in institutions and entities uh, that they can maintain a distance from either political side. Uh, and that's something that I think is extremely important, especially in the health space of FDA and others that are both our regulators making sure that things are healthy and safe for all of us. Uh, you don't want to be in a place where you're questioning whether uh, you're going to give the vaccine to yourself or to your child when we get to those stages. We are dependent on these scientists doing the processes they need to do. When it comes to a decision about what level of efficacy, you know, should, are we going to do vaccines if they're 50% efficacy, you know, they're they are effective at 50%, 60%, 70 Those are important things where there will be conversations uh, about that. But some of the basic science issues, they need to be uh, able to function independently. I would imagine, and this is probably relevant in your current job too, there's a little bit of a tricky dance. You were there as a political, you were the head of the, uh, the, your, of the cabinet department, and yet you are overseeing people with scientific credentials that you do not have. And uh, and so to some extent, there's probably like a, literally a linguistic problem in how you guys all talk about problems. But, uh, but what is that challenge like as a leader? You know, I was fortunate um, when I got to HHS. So, you know, I had known Tony Fauci uh, for many years because my work at the Gates Foundation um, in, in terms of knowing and my work at the Gates Foundation in terms of some of the health issues, especially in the vaccine space and that sort of thing, where that was something that I was fortunate that I'd had the uh, time to be exposed. But I think one of the things that um, you need to do is take the time to learn at a level where you can ask the questions that you need to ask. There's independence and then there's asking the questions that are legitimate and important questions that you need to do. And I would have daily meetings of the Ebola team that would involve the scientists, you know, it would involve FDA, NIH, CDC, um, as well as folks who were working on making sure that we had hospitals prepared and that the hospitals in the country were asking people appropriate questions about Ebola when they came in and bringing everyone together so that we worked and functioned as a team on a daily basis to work through these issues and ask appropriate questions. And, you know, asking questions is not inappropriate. How one thinks about letting the science stand is a, a different thing. One of the other things that was in your purview was uh, Obamacare, uh, the ACA. Um, the current administration obviously came into office with a promise to uh, end it. Uh, were you surprised it survived? No, no. And right. if you spoke with, uh, my team, the day after the, you know, I, of course, met with our, um, our team, our, our political appointees and our other appointees um, in various forms right after the election. And what I said is it will, it will stay. It will take a tremendous amount of work, but it will stay. And the reason that I believe that, and I believe that today, is it gets back to one of the first questions you asked me. Start with the substance. In Washington, D.C., I know that's um, old-fashioned and maybe not what most people think, but like always start with the substance. And the substance of this issue, the Affordable Care Act made important progress 
on both access, quality, and affordability. And for, you can talk to any American and they know somebody with a pre-existing condition. Anyone knows someone with a pre-existing condition. Rolling back any number of things that were part of the Affordable Care Act was something that many Americans, when it came to understanding what it would mean, that would not be something that would be uh, a preferred thing. And so that's why I believed it could survive with the work to make sure that you were connecting the substance to what people understood. What about a second Trump term? They've, they've downplayed uh, opposition to the ACA in their reelection campaign, but there is a major Supreme Court case pending. Uh, and there is this notion that it could uh, be caused to collapse under its own weight. How confident are you that it would survive? You know, I think it's important that people understand and know the facts around this. Right now, healthcare is a really important issue for Americans. It was an important issue even before COVID-19 in terms of how people think about one of the most important things to them. And understanding that the current court case that is before the, uh, you know, will be moving to the Supreme Court uh, in terms of a, a case that is being driven uh, by the current administration will undermine uh, many of those progress. To say that you want to preserve pre-existing conditions, uh, the protection of pre-existing conditions so people can get health care who have pre-existing conditions, um, the simplest way to do that right now would be to get rid of that case. And so I think it's important that as we go into a, an important time of decision making that many Americans know and understand uh, what are the, the decisions that they as individuals make that will impact their own health care. What do you think the effect would be if the court tossed it? The, the effect in terms of if the court decides against, but which, which way are you saying? If the, if the case goes away, if the case uh, goes away, we can, wins. Uh, if, the, if that happens, it will, the way that the case is constructed, it will undermine any number of parts of the entire Affordable Care Act. And whether that's, you know, I, I'm not actually sure what would happen the day after in terms of if you have your child on your policy uh, up to 26. Mm -hmm. you, it could, it, as constructed, it would bring down the act. You know, the issues of policies, kids on your policy up to 26, um, lifetime annual limits, pre-existing conditions, things that we have come to exist, think of as the the fabric of healthcare. Mm -hmm. The idea that you don't have annual limits. I mean, I met the people when I was secretary who delayed their cancer treatment because they were already at their annual limit. I met young people who had had brain surgery who had met their lifetime limits for healthcare at the age of like 16. That's not a place that I think most Americans want to return to. And your own party, the Democrats, had a big divide this year about Medicare for all. Where did you come down on that? You know, what I believe and have believed <clears throat> is one of the things in our healthcare conversation is that people use phrases and words that mean different things to different people. So I believe in having this conversation about healthcare, it's always important to say exactly what one means and believes. And what I believe that is that in the United States, access to healthcare is something we want for all Americans. We have a place, a plan, and an approach that we can get there. We made progress where 20 million more Americans received health coverage. A number of those are, are losing it in, in, in this current time, but 20 million more Americans held health care coverage. And what we need to do is figure out how we get the rest of the way. And I think there are any number of ways to do that. And that's the conversation that I think we need to be having right now is how to build on the system that we have to get the rest of the way. So if there's a bill uh, that uh, Senator Schaefer from the District of Columbia here has introduced, uh, and it uh, takes the, uh, the act that created Medicare and crosses out the 65 and older part uh, and, um, and amends it that thusly, how does uh, Senator Burwell of West Virginia vote on that? So um, Senator Burwell has been in uh, politics long enough and around government long enough to know to not work in hypotheticals uh, in terms of that. 
<laughs> but what I will say is, you know, I believe right now there are any number of ways to continue to expand coverage. We see states right now in the middle of all of this voting to expand their Medicaid. That would be an important step to um, get coverage. And the other thing about the Medicaid coverage that's important is that program is what you would refer to as a counter cyclical program. In other words, when one is having deep economic difficulties for the country, it's a program that helps us get through that. It helps individuals get through that. And as we think through the tools that we're doing, I think hopefully as a nation, as we get to, and I believe that we will, the other side of COVID, both from a health perspective, as well as um, the perspective of economics, that we're gonna think about what tools do we have to make these time periods work better for us as a nation, economically as a whole, and economically as individuals. And so those are the kinds of things that I think we can see. I think we know that there are groups of people who are at certain levels where subsidies would be helpful uh, and changing the subsidy level would be helpful. There are all kinds of things that you can do when you get to the basics of the substance of what are you trying to do. And I believe we all agree, affordability, access, and quality. That's what you're trying to do in healthcare. That's what you're trying to do in higher ed. And I think getting everybody, let's agree on that, and then let's get to the conversations of what paths help us get there. Well, let's talk about the higher ed bit of it for a second, because if we're thinking about a, God help us, post-COVID COVID world, um, how do you see your job changing in the next few years? You have talked about a $100 million loss for AU. Uh, the finances of any university in the 21st century were already a challenge. Uh, how are you going to address that? So, you know, there's the immediate challenge, and then I think there's the long-term question uh, in terms of what are the lessons that we learn and how do we apply those as we uh, go out of COVID. In the immediate term, I'm fortunate that at American University, um, we have had policies and approaches that have created reserves and help. Will we need to do tough things? Yes, but are we needing to do things that uh, a number of other institutions have had to do in terms of large-scale layoffs and those kinds of things? That's not something that we see um, in our future. As I've planned, and you won't be surprised as a former director of OMB, um, as I've planned for the university, I actually have planned for a two-year approach. That you know, I'm hopeful that we get to a different place sooner than that, and that'll be terrific. But in order to be a good steward of the institution and um, serving our students, our parents, our faculty, and our staff well, we have a, are putting in place a two-year plan to get through this. I think as we think through, though, the longer term issues, uh, we need to hear the fact that for many families across this country and for our nation in terms of the importance of higher ed, that having inflation that is greater than core inflation for periods of long, long periods of time is something that can't continue. So we need to work on the ways um, and think about the ways that we can work on affordability and access for the university. And I think that's both in how we think about what we offer and different people need different things at the same time, but we know they're gonna still want that four year face-to-face -face degree. But it also has to do with things like thinking about affordability. During this period of time, you mentioned, we, uh, you know, we see that we could be 100 million short in revenue, but at the same time at American University, we committed $13 million more to our financial aid for our undergraduates. When we decided to go online and that we wouldn't have residences, we didn't adjust our students' cost of attendance for purposes of making, figuring out their financial aid. Um, we are working in as many ways as we can to support the families, because those are the kinds of things that I think we need to do now, but we are thinking about also, and have been thinking about how we do these things over the long term. There was already a national conversation going on here with online learning and parents in a tougher country thinking, gee, is it really worth it to send my child all the way across the country so they can live in a dorm and have an experience uh, when uh, they can acquire the same credential living here at home? And what, what's, the, what's the sales pitch for uh, flying across the country and having an experience? You know, it is what you said earlier when you asked the question. It is about that face-to-face -face experience um, that I think we believe adds that value in terms of being here in Washington, D.C., the kinds of experiences that you can have in, in Washington, D.C. And I think it's important to remember the classroom learning is extremely important, but also how our students learn from each other. And those that can 
have that experience uh, at that time and point in their life, I think that's something that's going to continue to be valued. And another part of this that I think we have not discussed, we talked about the health crisis, we talked about the economic crisis, but we really have not focused on the uh, fact that the issues of structural and institutional racism in our country are front and center and how students experience both learning and getting tools and being part of a place trying to work that through and work on that, I think is also something that's gonna be extremely important. And as a president of a university, as I think about the world and the issues that we're focused on, that's something that is front and center too, which I think you probably heard as we were talking about the anti-racist um, center and why we're gonna go forward even in a time of hiring freeze, we believe that's something that is front and center as a priority for our institution. And uh, I've got a couple questions from the audience before I let you go. Uh, one of uh, anonymous attendee asks, uh, what would you say is the best major for students to succeed later in life in today's world? And I think this dovetails a little bit with the, some of the changes we're talking about. I think that the best major for students to succeed in the rest of their life is the one that they have a passion about. I would encourage every student to do good digital and data analytics because I believe whether you are an artist or a musician or at our School of Public Affairs, you need to understand how to use data and analytics. But in terms of that success in life, I actually believe it is very much related to what makes your heart sing and what you have a passion about. Because if those two things are in place, you're gonna be very good. I guess that's a pretty good answer because uh, there was a lot of departments there who could have been really angry depending on what you said. <laughs> but I, I believe it, you know, I have a, you know, a liberal arts education, you know, you can go many places with many different things and do many different things. But if you're happy and passionate, um, you work hard and I think it makes a difference. And, you know, it's an election year, um, which is sort of one even more poignant thing about this, the empty campuses, because usually there's a lot of uh, agitation around politics. Is the university going to do anything to help or encourage students to vote wherever they happen to be? It was an issue. The issue, obviously, at American University, our School of Public Affairs, our School of International Servants, many students come. Before, we had had programs where our students actually were up um, for the primaries. They've been in New Hampshire. They've been in South Carolina. Um, we're doing all of those things from a curricular perspective around the election. With regard to voting, we're making sure that our students have the information so they know uh, about that. And there are some efforts that are often student-led about registration uh, for voting. Well, listen, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. This is a lot of fun talking to you. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, and um, I wish you luck. Thank you. Uh, need it and invite you over to uh, come over and see the Arboretum. Uh, there's not in terms of a, a great time to walk the campus. And None see of those stinking students will get in my way. <laughs> well, hopefully we're going to have them back. Uh, you know, we're going to work hard to get them back as quickly as we possibly can. I think we're all hoping so. Thank you, Thank you very much.